What's up, world? This is I Will Fafore. What's going on, good people? This is I Will Shayun. Welcome back to another episode of the Who Made Y'all Priest podcast, where we talk about our spiritual journeys, our everyday life experiences, and the issues of the times from the perspective of two people who just happen to be priests. Fafore, what's going on, man? Hey, man. What's going on? Man, you know. You know me. I'm blessed and highly favored. I say, I say. <laughs> I'm blessed and highly favored, man. What's been going on with you, man? It seemed like it seemed like it's been a long time in between episodes, man. What's going on? Yeah, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Man, these last, I'm gonna say two, two and a half weeks have been wild for me. Like, wow. I did a, a 16 day detox. And so this time I decided that. You know, it was going to be more than just a physical thing. I really wanted this to be mind, body, and spirit. So I divined on my detox. I did a spiritual bath the whole night. Now, my divination was wild, right? It talked about this expansion of consciousness. All right? So I said, oh, that sounds like what I'm thinking it's going to be, mind, body, and spirit. This, this is going to be on. But it talked about my consciousness being expanded and, you know, I needed to go deeper than the surface on things that were going to happen, right? Experiences I was going to have. So I said, okay, cool. So I'm going on my, my nightly walk, right? And as I'm going on my walk, I see this big white bird. And so I don't think nothing of it. Next day, same place, same big white bird. About three, four days later, I see the bird every time that I go for a walk, same place. It's um, an egret, which is in the family with uh, heron, like, uh, like the blue heron that we see around here in Houston all the time. And so I got this book, Animal Speak. So I go through the book and I find the herons. It talks about what that means. Basically, similar to my reading, right? Talked about, you know, uh, them having, you know, long legs and long necks and beaks so they can go deep in the water and how I was supposed to go deep. And um, it talked about not only uh, balance, but just, again, this whole concept of expansion, right? So, man, I'm like, what's this all about? Man, well, so it happened. You ever study something and then you like, you know, you kind of get away from it for whatever reason. And then whether some months later, some years later, you come back to it and you like, it got you wide open this time for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. And so you and I got the Nakamadi and the book of Enoch and all of that long time ago, we was reading that. Man, I've been going crazy on this Billy Carson stuff lately. Right. Man. Like, I've been following Billy Carson on IG for years. I mean, I don't know, probably eight years or more. But I never really pay attention to his stuff, right? I kind of knew high level what he talked about. But again, like I said, you know, Book of Enoch, all that stuff way back when. And I just kind of got away from it. And on my own, as, you know, reading all these texts, you know, I would have different ideas. And then, you know, then I have some gaps. Like I said, then I, my mind will wander off to something else. I'm a Sagittarius moon. I, I, I like to, you know, information comes my way. I'm going to just pick it up and read through it. And I kind of get distracted as well, trying to get more and more information. Sometimes I get off track. But, yo. This whole thing, man, about these Sumerian tablets and these ancient writings about the Anunnaki and how 
the Anunnaki came to earth and there was not homo sapiens sapiens, but um, homo erectus were here and how the working class aliens that came with them got tired of working. And so they, they used our DNA to create like a, basically like a slave class and how that didn't work. Cause they were like ligers, you know what I'm saying? Like you can make it, but then they can't produce babies on their own. So they took the genetic material from that and then put it in the womb of one of the women, Isis. And she gave birth to the Adamu or the first man, Adam. And then they created a woman. Man, I'm like, yo, mind blown. Like, mind blown. Like, you know, I've always said, while well, I'm not a Christian, obviously. But I've always had appreciation for the Bible. To me, this takes the Bible to a whole new level. It opens up a whole new world. Now, I know if you have a traditional way of viewing it, most people are going to stay there. I get it. But, yo, if you can just open your mind up and look over this information completely unbiased, Mm -hmm. mind blown you know and, this is <laughs> go ahead go ahead no no go ahead you, you go ahead you know you know this is this is like one of those instances where when the people closest to you tell you about certain things you hear it you know you paying a little bit of attention but you kind of but you kind of brush it off and then later you uh you hear about it and it's and it's and it's kind of uh like you say mind blowing but just so the just so the uh, the people that's uh, that's watching can understand that I told you about uh, Zachariah <laughs> Sitchin and the Twelfth Planet and the Sumerian tablets and the Anunnaki and the Planet Nibiru. I told you about that stuff years ago, years ago. Like man, you need to check this out, man. Check this out. Get on the Twelfth Planet, man. They talking about they talking about all of this. They talking about the. Uh, the, the Anunnaki crash landing here coming from the planet Nibiru to mine gold to uh, replenish their atmosphere and all of that. I told you about that years ago, but now you get Billy Carson, somebody who you don't even know, who you've been, <laughs> you've been following for years. <laughs> he tell you about the about the Sumerian tablets and now you hear it first. You hear it first in the Sumerian tablets now, man. Well, you know me. I'm a, I'm a Virgo. I'm an Earth song. You know what I'm saying? Just hit my 46th birthday couple of days ago. Okay. And for me, everything is about practicality. Like, I got to a point where I go from learning all, all this information till it's like, okay, I got to take all this information and filter it to the lens of how is it going to make me some money? How is it going to improve my health? How is it going to improve my mental health? How is it going to add value to my life? Like it, it had to have some kind of a tangible, ben tangible benefit after a while. Before I was at a point where I would, when I was reading it at first, way back when, it was, I just wanted to know, I wanted to know. And then at some point it was like, all right, look, let me focus. At some point I got a transition from wanting to know to how is this going to move me forward? And so there were certain things I had to kind of get away from. Now, the funny thing is that you say that, because at my ETA, I remember Bob was saying, um, you know, keep learning and, and stay open minded because as you grow, you know, um, you will learn new things and you will change the way you look at things and just always stay in that space of open mindedness. And sure enough, the whole alien talk, that was at some point I was like, I'm not talking about aliens. I'm not talking about whether or not the earth is round or flat. Again, what am I going to do with that information? I ain't going to be able to pay no bills with that information. So, like, you know, I, I, I need something tangible. And I do feel that spirituality does provide a lot of a tangible, measurable um, outcome for our, our greater good. But I was like, those things, I don't know. But, yeah, I'm not saying that. I necessarily agree. I'm not saying I disagree either. I'm saying 
he make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> and, and and like, you know, like uh, the generations before us would say, everybody can't be wrong. And in every corner of the earth, everybody's saying the same thing. Yeah, everybody's telling the same story. I remember uh, I was telling you about this, uh, this composition notebook that I brought home with me from prison. Uh, and I wrote in that composition notebook this this long list of uh, the pantheons of these ancient civilizations, whether it be the Sumerians, the Babylonians, uh, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks. Uh, and you find this synchronicity between all of them, that they are all telling the same story, that there were these advanced beings that came from somewhere else. We, we don't know. Uh, where they come from, but in the cuneiform tablets and the Sumerian writings, they say that they came from a planet called Nibiru. But, Nibiru. Uh, but these beings came from somewhere else, and that every time they came, they brought new technology with them. Then, when you add to that the Book of Enoch and the Book of Enoch talking about the Watchers and how they gave certain technology unto man, fire, uh, weapons those types of things. The story is being told time and time and time again from time immemorial, from the time that human beings started to write about uh, who they were and what beings were in uh, this cosmological belief. They were talking about these things coming from uh, from other places. The way right. uh, what, what Zachariah Sitchin gets to in, uh, in the 12th planet uh, and for those of you who have an open mind and want to check that out, yeah, Zachariah Sitchin, The Twelfth Planet, he talks about that it wasn't until uh, monotheism or the birth of monotheism where you get this one God that kind of seems bipolar or schizophrenic. And it's because they've tried to merge so many entities, so many deities and roll it up into one being. And so it always looks as if God is going against itself. You know, God is love, God is kindness, but God tells you uh, to kill every man, woman, and child. And mm -hmm. it's it's because of that. It's because of trying to roll up all of these deities into one supreme deity that uh, we get this uh, schizophrenic God in uh, in the Bible. But yeah, man, check that out, man. I love mm -hmm. I love reading the Twelfth Planet. Uh, now, at some point, it does get to where uh, these people are called astronaut theorists. Uh, and you start to get into the Zachariah Sitchin, the Eric Von Daniken, and other people that even gets to the point of talking about uh, human beings could not have built the pyramids that these ancient aliens came uh, to the planet and built those pyramids themselves as ways of travel or as uh, beacons telling them where to land, blase, blase, blase. So it, it, it eventually does get to that point where it's like, uh, it starts to kind of go off like really on a tangent, but yeah, man, if you got a, if you got an open mind and you're willing to, uh, to look at the Bible from a different perspective, the 12th planet, Zachariah Sitch and Billy Carson, that's it. Right, right. And to be clear, though, for those who aren't familiar with the information, when he talks about, you know, Anunnaki, which uh, beings that come from heaven to earth, they're not talking about E.T. They're talking about people that look like me and you from another planet who have advanced technology. And through that advanced technology, they are able to do all kinds of different things, right? And so there are gonna be people though, who, again, I'm not saying I'm 100% so or not, but I'm saying it's making a whole lot of sense. There are gonna be people who wanna hold on to Africans built the pyramids who are going to be like, they don't, they're not going to want to have any, any piece of that, right? Because if that's the truth, then it's going to come into question the greatness of the African people, which for, you know, the lifetime of everybody who is alive now, Black people have kind of been at the bottom of the total pole, or actually the same really would be the top of the total pole, but you know, we have um, been treated as second class citizens for hundreds of years. And so that kind of was our claim to fame. So I think that's going to be something that's going to pull people away. Now, some people will still say 
African people did build the pyramids. They just were, I mean, they're still us. They have, you know, we all have alien DNA. This is what Billy Carson is saying, but they were aided with this advanced technology from the Anunnaki and particularly like this Atlantean civilization who built all these different pyramids. But man, it gets it gets crazy. Talk about how you know uh, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, is actually um, Satan, you know, or or the devil. Talk about how Inky in, injected in us some 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 extra for us to be able to be great because we were created to be this subservient race and and or a subservient uh, group of people. I'm not saying race like, you know, black, white or whatever. But it does make sense because the overwhelming majority of people do kind of fall in line with similar beliefs and kind of go with the crowd. Right. And every every election cycle or at least a presidential election cycle, you kind of see that kind of energy. Right. Where everybody is going crazy and fighting over somebody to rule over them. Right. Regardless of if you're actually having any real benefit to one from one party or the next. And so and, and then look how many people are really beholden to uh, religion or dogma in general. So it makes sense. Like it, it's a lot of things that make sense. Like I said, you know, me studying this thing over the years and putting things together, I it, it, it filled in some gaps. What he was saying filled in some gaps. So, you know, I'm going to stay in the middle. I'm going to stay open-minded, you know, like you and I always say, I'm not married to any belief. You know, I'm going to go where the information takes me. Right. And, you know, I don't have any bias whatsoever. Yeah, no dog in the fight at all. Absolutely. No dog Absolutely. So, so look, you ready so, to get to this episode? Yeah, man. This is, this is, this is going to be one of those episodes right here, man. For those... For those of you who don't remember seeing our uh, our guest, uh, we interviewed him back a few seasons ago, uh, and that uh, episode was titled "Ifa in the Bible." Uh, mm -hmm. We got we got some rave reviews about uh, about that episode. A lot of people talking about going back and reading the Bible again, studying the Bible again, and trying to find these things that. Uh, our next guest was uh, was talking about. So if you haven't already, go check out that episode, and then we're gonna get into this episode right here with our uh, with our Baba Ty. Aboro oh, boy, yeah, Baba Ty, how you been, man? How you doing? Good, brothers, good. How y'all doing, man? How y'all doing? Good, love you, Baba. Love you, love you. Good to see y'all again. <laughs> good to As see a, you again. Always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I was just I was just telling the people that if they uh didn't watch the last episode that we did with you Ifa and the Bible that, that they need to go back and watch that episode and then come back and watch this one because we really we getting ready to really get into it right here yeah right <laughs> we get ready to get into it so for those people who uh who don't follow instructions and who don't go back and watch the uh, <laughs> the first the first video we want you to introduce yourself to the people once again and talk to us about your, we still are the Who Made Y'all Priest podcast and we still talk about our spiritual journey. So talk okay. to us a little bit about uh, who you are and how you got to where you are spiritually. Okay. Uh, my mom and daddy named me Todd Jackson. Um, I was, um, my spiritual journey, man, it, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic with this conversation tonight, but uh was born born and raised in the church all my life african methodist episcopal church uh became a minister in ame church around 96. um uh, just always was studying and reading stuff man i, I was I, I wanted to always know i've always had questions and so i just was constantly researching came across uh the late aluo afalabia paper mm -hmm. he introduced me to to ifa and um, ironically, uh, the people in, in Nigeria who introduced me, who brought me into this spiritual tradition, they said, you cannot leave the church. You must go back to the church and help our people with Ifa. So uh, I've been 
you know, this spiritual journey has been uh, very interesting to me. Uh, started something, uh, uh, I, I like to call it a community. We call it International Church of Health and Wealth. So we're all mm -hmm. about teaching purpose, uh, teaching people about who they are, and the power of their mind through the use of meditation. And that was my assignment given to me by my Luo um, back in 2007. So uh, that's that's kind of how I got to this point right here, my brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's 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 beautiful. So uh, we got we got a, we got a minister and a babalawo on the uh, on the podcast all at the same time. <laughs> all at I'll the say. Same time. I'll say. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful combination. Will that be in somewhere? Will that, we set records, huh? We are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, a lot of people tuned in. A lot of people who weren't even practitioners of EFI tuned into that last one, you know, okay. being okay. that, you know, Christianity is the, the predominant belief system in the world. So, yeah, a lot of people tapped in, you know. Uh, you made some people mad. <laughs> and, you, know, you, you had some others being like, man, I didn't know that. And so, uh, you know, I loved it. It was a beautiful episode. Oh, she right. loved it, you know. And then, but for the most part, the el the overwhelming majority of the people who we talked to absolutely loved it. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So Bob, we've been having this conversation on our minds, me and Oshayun, man. We talk all the time about different things, right? And this is gonna be one of those things gonna be controversial. But I just want to let the people know, you know, we're not doing it for controversy. We're yeah. just trying to do it to expand consciousness. Because this is a question. This is a, a thought that, you know, the two of us have, have had. And so before I introduce the topic, I want everybody who's listening to uh, for, for the duration of the show, act like you're not watching a podcast. Act mm. like we're in a courtroom and you are a juror. And if anybody has been on a jury, then we know that the role of the jury is to be objective, okay. you know, and the case has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And so the three of us are going to be lawyers. We're, we're, now, we're no longer our woes. We're going to be lawyers and we're going to present the facts of the case. And we just want everybody to listen without judgment, you know, um, Go again, be in the middle, be objective, be open minded as we present the information. As we see in D5, we're going to call black, black, and red, red. We will not see black and call it red. We will not see red and call it black. You know, so, all we're going to do is we're going to present the information. And so, for as long as Oshayun and myself have been in the tradition, and we've talked to elders that have been in the, the tradition way longer than us. There has been a saying in E5, and it probably has existed for hundreds of years, ever since you had Christian missionaries go over to Nigeria and find themselves in the villages of Nigeria. And we know they found the, the old E5 and they translated it into their language. They translated it to English and probably other languages. But when they came across Eshu, they said, oh, this is the devil in their mm. tradition. And so for as long as these Christian missionaries, like I said, go back hundreds of years, have been saying Eshu is the devil. Those of us who are Ifa practitioners have been saying Ifa, uh, Eshu, excuse me, is not the devil. Well, a few years ago, <laughs> Hoshe, you and myself were talking and we said, you know what? We actually think that Eshu is the devil. Mm. Now, before y'all turn off the show, <laughs> you know, you know, we want you, you know, to hear us out. And as we present the information, you know, again, we're still here to be open minded. 
And we knew that, you know, because this show was going to be or this topic was going to be controversial. We knew that we couldn't just the two of us have the conversation ourselves. So we said we need to find somebody else to join us on this conversation. Mm -hmm. And it had to be an elder. And what best what better elder to have to have this conversation than our favorite pastor priest, Bob the Top. <laughs> right. And so what we're going to present here today is information that is not a misrepresentation in, in our opinion, at least myself in Oshayun, it's not a misrepresentation of Eshu. What you're really going to find out is that it's a misrepresentation of the devil and who the devil is and the purpose that the devil served in the Bible. Wow. So, Baba Todd, we want to get into this thing. And first, we want to start off with a conversation for people who may know, who, who may practice, who practice E5, those who may practice E5 really don't know, and everybody else in between. Let's talk about SU and um, tell us who is SU? To, to, Eshu to me is the divine messenger. He is the policeman of the Orishas. Everybody got to check. Everybody got to check in with Eshu, man. Uh, before you, hey, you don't get to get into the party unless you check with Eshu. You know, and he gonna right. check. He gonna check your ticket. If, you, if mm -hmm. it ain't, don't nothing happen with Eshu. So, uh, to me, he is the. The S, he's a great communicator. You know, he is the one that opens the door. Uh, he is the one that lets you cross the threshold. Mm -hmm. So, so in a sense, you know, you you can't get nothing done without that shoe. Uh, you know, he's he's the confidant of Ola Demare. Um, to me, he is the one that helps you decide on which direction to go. He's standing there at the crossroads. So he, he, he's, you can be looked at, he, he, he can be looked upon as a mediator, you know, a communicator. Uh, when you look at some of the, the traits, you know, he's people that are good in any type of communicating a message from one person to the other. It could be in writing, uh, can be in music, uh, technology. You know, he corresponds to the nervous system, you know. Mm. So, and what does the nervous system do? You know, it sends messages. Mm -hmm. All through the body. So basically the one word is the messenger. Well, he's our divine messenger. That, that that's how I would best describe this. I see. But you know, I, I think brothers, oh well, I don't want to get too far ahead, but, but let's, I'm, I'm gonna go with the flow. Because I think <laughs> we, we need and, and we can come back, I can come back and talk about where this whole concept comes from. So, but I'm I'm gonna let it flow with the next question. Okay. No, so you're talking about the concept of uh, what a concept exactly? Of, 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 of where SU becomes, he becomes known as the devil. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get into that a little bit later. All right. Yeah, I'm, that's why I was I held my horses there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we talked a, a little bit about uh, about SU. Now we want to talk about the devil or say and what his purpose is who he is uh what purpose he serves in the cosmology of christianity um from my understanding satan is uh the representation of evil in the dichotomy between good and evil uh the greatest definition we get of satan and his place in the cosmology is in the book of job where uh Satan uh, presents himself before God along with the sons of God, who many people will say those are the angels, the Malachim, the, the messengers of God. And it seems that Satan in this sense is a, is a tempter. He's the one that causes death. He's the one that causes chaos um, and all of these different things. He is the one, according to Christian doctrine. He's the one that tempts you to do any of the evils that uh, that we consider uh, men and women to do. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about who Satan or the devil is. 
in in modern day Christianity is just what you said. He's the antagonist to God. He is the the one that is going to do everything to keep you off track, to do everything contrary to you fulfilling your purpose. But but I I like to say this though, brothers. I think when we look at the devil, Satan, what you just described, my brother, is when you do it from a uh, a literal translation. See, that's where we have our problems. You know, there, there. Jesus said, "I speak to these people in parables." You know, the disciples are asking him, "You know, why are you always talking to these people in parables?" Those that have an ear, let them hear. But for you, I talk about and give you the key, the, the keys to the, 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 the mystery to the kingdom of heaven. Now, when you, there's a such thing between exoteric and esoteric. The esoteric, hey man, Satan, devil, G Jesus, Eshu, they all look the same. Mm. But if we're going to do it from a literal exoteric perspective, yeah, then Satan is the great enemy. Satan mm -hmm. is the one that fell from heaven because he was at war with God. He was that one that is fighting everything. And if we look at uh, European Western thought, you have to have an antagonist. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to have somebody that is fighting. Now, we know in most African traditional uh, spiritual systems, there is no devil. But for this conversation in this court case, uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to agree with you, brothers, on an esoteric level, the devil and SU is the same individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that always threw me off about the devil or how Christians in general or people in general speak about the devil is my question was always, where did you get that from? Because mm -hmm. like Oshayun said, the devil is talked about in Job for the first time, depending on how you look at it. And the reason I say depending on how you look at it, you have, I think it was Paul maybe, who referenced the devil as a serpent. So then you can go to the book of Genesis and say, okay, well, that's where you know, the devil or Satan first appeared. But then after that, then when um, Jesus goes out to fast in the wilderness for 40 days, then you see Satan show up to try to tempt him. But other than that, you don't see the devil. Now, there are um, certain comments in the Bible or references to a devil. Like people would talk about people who were like possessed, they would do things and they would say, you know, they have a devil in them. So there seems to be a distinction in the Bible between a devil and the devil um, that we call Satan. So can you speak to that a little bit? It, is there a difference or maybe a mistranslation or talk us, talk us through that part? You, you know, well, you're right. And Job was the first introduction. Believe it or not, Job was the first book of the Bible. It is the oldest book of the Bible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was the encounter with, with Jesus and the devil on the on the mountaintop. When Jesus went through his 40 day um, uh, transformation. Um, his his presence to me shows up in several other places. I want to say, um, well, he spoke about in Isaiah as the light bearer. Mm -hmm. um, he was cast down, the one that's bringing light. Uh, he was referred to in Ezekiel. And I want to say there was one more place uh, uh, that he was referred to as an, as an actual individual that came down. But to me, the most prominent story was his encounter with Jesus on the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that, uh, he he came, and I, I don't want to go too ahead of the story, but he was he was at telling Jesus in a sense, man, look, you know, just, you come on down, I can give you this. And in that story, you see him as an evil, as negative, 
because he was trying to get off track. But like I said earlier, if we go back to the esoteric, you will see him in a good light. When you talk mm -hmm. about him being a light bearer coming down, he's illuminating something. Mm -hmm. Right. He's bringing, he's bringing uh, a new vision, clarity. And he comes to us too. Uh, that esoteric devil, when we when we are at a place where we can't make up our mind. When we we in a state of confusion, we in chaos. Right. And what does S U do? If you're not careful, S U will bring about chaos in mm -hmm. order for you to come to a place of clarity, to come to a place of certainty. So, uh, yeah, uh, he's the light. He's he's referred to as the light bearer. Mm -hmm. Right, right. No, so it's interesting about what you just stated about the negativity that comes with SU when he meets us at that crossroads. Now the old dude, um, or Warren Solve says that it's not SU the trickster as we try to always state, but it's actually the negativity that we bring to ourselves due to our own stubbornness and refusal to change that actually brings on that negativity. However, just like the devil, as we get into the similarity between the devil and SU, just how people like to blame the devil for everything, we too have a tendency to do that and we blame Eshu for the negativity. Um, and so again, another, to me, more evidence that Eshu is the same or the devil is the character that we call Eshu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think both are there to push you let's just use this picture for for example you know the devil uh has always been presented as somebody in a red suit with a pitchfork to me that pitchfork is there to push you and prod you to make a move when you uh are stuck you don't want to change you don't want to move forward uh and, and and to me that is that is that is one of the things whether you in e5 or christianity if you're not careful, you're going to find a scapegoat for you not moving and doing what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you, you, you're going to find, see, this whole spiritual journey, I don't care what you call yourself, is about you being accountable to your purpose and what you're here to do. It's easy to find a scapegoat. You know, in the church, the <laughs> devil made me do it. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm battling. The devil was there, man. That's why, that's why, that's why they fired me on that job. But you ain't tell the folks you late all the time. You you know, you 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 got a record of being late. You leave early, you stay long for lunch. Now that that ain't the devil. That ain't that you. You know, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> so you know, it's about it's about to me those two figures, which is one and the same. Uh it's about making you be accountable, man. Mm -hmm. Making you making you do what you need to do. How many times in church, man, have people, the poor devil, man, been lied on so much? Mm. You know, and if people are just accountable for what they do and who they are and what they know they need to be about, uh, you will hear the devil mention very few. Probably you wouldn't even hear him no more. People understood. Mm. And then if you're in E5, you think you need a ritual all the time or you need to go to SU all the time, you may just need to sit still and get some clarity. And mm -hmm. SU may be pushing you to a point to sit down somewhere, meditate, get your thoughts together, be clear with your notes, and then move forward. Because to me, that's what, that's what, in an esoterical metaphysical perspective, that's where I see the devil and SU being one of the same. Now, if we get into uh, an exoteric thing and uh, reading the the Bible for what it is and what it talks about and how it talks about the devil of Satan and in the Odui file, how it talks about Eshu, I think we can agree that both are tempters, that both uh, <laughs> in their own ways cause, uh, cause chaos, that they both in their own way cause uh, death and destruction i for me i think the only difference that i found so far between satan and eshu is that eshu usually brings about death destruction chaos only after 
you haven't followed his instructions, uh, that that he seeks to be venerated or or worshipped. And if you are not doing those things, then SU is on you. He's a he's about bringing uh, catastrophe and chaos and things like that. From what I've read in the Bible, that doesn't seem to be the case with Satan. It's not as if he's making an attempt to get you to worship him or venerate him. He only wants you to be off the path of your destiny. That's it. He's not he's not seeking for any uh any reverence or veneration, only for you to be off the uh the path of your destiny. So what do you got to say about that in those in those similarities and those differences? Yeah, from a Christian perspective. The only thing Satan has come and may come to do is steal, kill, and destroy. Right. And uh, there is no no other path. There is nothing else. He has no other sign. From day one, he's caused confusion. Uh, he is to defeat you. He is to stop you from going to heaven. Uh, he is to keep you away from Jesus. Uh, that has been the concept. And you know, when the... Uh, the missionaries whole thing when they came into into Nigeria well yeah into Nigeria they had to they they saw the Orishas and observed and noted the Orishas but they had to have an antagonist they had to have mm -hmm. an evil entity and SU was the cl closest thing that they could find so when you look at the Bible in that way man it you'll never you're gonna always have to for one you got to have the good versus the evil you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing with the end of, end of the world, the apocalypse, the, the, the battle, you know, for the end of the world, you got to have somebody on the side, the bad side, and somebody on the good side. You know, this is all part of Western theology. You know, uh, this country we live in, man, been in existence 200 some years, uh, 200, you know, plus some years, we're probably only at peace 30 some, 30 or 40 years. So, and that is a part of the theology that is expressed. That is a part of the theological concept that is presented and uh, and carried out. And so, mm -hmm. you know, in that sense, the devil, he's he's reverence, but he's fear. So, fear is that element um, mm -hmm. that, that has to be there. So, I got to object a little bit, O'Shea. Okay. Got to push back a little <laughs> bit. Come on, oh, yeah. So here's the thing I think I, I want to make sure that we define when it comes to the discussion of the devil. Are we talking about the, the common ideology of the devil? Or are we talking about the biblical perspective of the Bible? Because in the biblical um, portrayal of the devil, the devil didn't kill anybody. When we go back to the, the Genesis, I think it's the third chapter with the serpent. If we're calling that serpent based upon, I, it was one of the disciples, I want to say it was Paul, called the devil the serpent. So then you could assume that that serpent in Genesis was the devil. Yeah, yeah. What he did was, is he introduced information that expanded their consciousness. Because when the devil, I mean, when God, oh, that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> when, when, when God was looking for Adam, Adam said, I was naked, so I hid. And God said, how did you know you was naked? So basically what the serpent was doing is, hey, look, essentially your freedom is over there in, in eating from that tree. Because it's going to expand your consciousness and it's going to change your perception and perspective of yourself and the world around you. And it looked like the God was trying to keep everybody stupid, just based on the, the biblical depiction and making people worship. And like, you, like O'Shea said, the devil never asked to be worshipped at all. To me, when I see the devil, all he said was, Hey, look, have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about things from this perspective? But 
the one doing all the killing, the one doing all the maiming, the one who displayed narcissistic tendencies was not the devil. It was the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so I, I almost think that this, this ideology around the Bible wholly comes from things that are not supported by the portrayal of the devil in the Bible. And I think it's, it was done to be a smokescreen to what God was actually doing. Like when, when people talk about, oh, they shot up a school, the devil made him do it. Direct me to something in the Bible that says that the devil is capable of that type of thing. Because if I had to bet money on it and go, use the Bible to say somebody or something made him do it, I would say God. Because God was the one that was authoring his. <laughs> Respectfully. <laughs> Respectfully. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, man, uh, you, you you're right if you look at it from that perspective, but I think this this also this conversation also deals with for the black Christian a decolonization of scripture, mm. a decolonizing of the mind, mm. and it has you have to decolonize scripture in order to because if you look at it on the surface, brother, this is confusion. This yes. is mad because God was the same one that say when you go in, take everything, kill everything, kill the women. If they're not virgins, you can have the virgins, but kill everybody else, and you can take the virgins for yourself. Man. And you can rape them. You can rape them. According to the Bible. According, you know, and from that perspective of God deal in that old testament, you know, he, he's a gangster, man. Right. Yeah. So he, uh, you know, but like again, I, I keep saying, I know I sound like a broken record. If you're going to interpret scripture from that perspective, you're dealing with you're dealing with a chaotic god. You're dealing with a narcissist. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with a madman. Um, you're dealing with somebody on one hand, say how much they love you, and then on the next hand, I will to kill everything. Uh, you will be cursed from generation to generation, which is mm -hmm. the thing is that has really harmed black people more than anything. It's not dealing with a curse there. You're gonna make me, and then you're gonna curse me because of what somebody else did. You know, so uh the devil in that case, man, he ain't got no blood on his hand, bro. You right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't got no blood on his hand. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, you're making a strong point, man. I'm gonna send you to law school, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from a from a from an esoteric standpoint, I honestly see the devil as the ego. Um, when the way I see the the temptation on the mountain is, I see it as a conversation between the higher self and the ego. That's what. I see when I uh, when I read the description of the conversation that Jesus and Satan are having, it's this the dichotomy between uh, the higher self and the lower self. Uh, I think uh, Baba has always told us about uh, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey and how that represents uh, wisdom, wisdom over intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. So I do see uh, the Bible in the esoteric sense. However, most Christians are looking at the Bible from a surface, from a very surface level. And as mm -hmm. Bafuri said, most of the uh, dogma surrounding the devil, from what I've studied, um, came after uh, Dante's Inferno. And it seems as if the devil was fashioned uh, after that text. After that text, then we get this uh, portrayal of the devil in the way that we recognize him today. But it does seem as if, you know, we talk about the devil as, or uh, Satan or Lucifer as the light bringer, the one that brings consciousness and expansion. Even in uh, the book of Genesis, like Bob Foray was talking about, we're talking about uh, a being or an entity 
whether we call it uh, Satan, the devil, or just a serpent, something that was coming to bring understanding, something that was coming to bring an expansion of consciousness. So from what I read in the Bible, it seems as if Satan, the devil, is almost the good guy. He's the protagonist in this situation. Just as Eshu, although Eshu causes chaos and causes uh, death and destruction at times, Eshu is the good guy because he's the one that sits at the crossroad and making sure that you maintain your agency, making sure that you maintain your free will, making sure that you have alternatives mm -hmm. from which to choose uh, depending on which way you decide to take once you get to the crossroads. So again, we're talking about um, expansion, even if it's only a uh, expansion of choice. You know, I'm reading, I'm reading a, a an awesome book to me. Uh, it's written by one of the Oriates from the Lukumi tradition, and he talked about Eshu uh, leaving the shores of Africa and basically splitting into two beings once it got to Cuba. And mm -hmm. you have Eshu and Elegba, where, and some of them say Elegwa. Um, and Eshu is kind of seen as evil, the one that is loose in the world causing destruction and chaos, while uh, Elegwa or Elegba is seen as a mischievous child. So the this depiction of Eshu, I mean, Eshu does cause destruction. I don't know about, I haven't read any part of keys where Eshu actually kills anyone, but causing the deaths of, of people. I read that many, many, many times. So I yeah. do see a similarity. I do see a similarity between uh, Eshu and the devil. For sure. But then, so again, you, you say from a, a standpoint of causing death and destruction, where does the devil do that in the Bible? Um, no, nowhere, literally nowhere. And, and so that's my thing. We, we, there is, well, maybe, school of, where? maybe so in the, in the book of Job, it would seem as if God is given the devil the permission to do everything that needs to be done to Job for Job to curse God. And one of those things that Satan did, according to the book of Job, was that he killed or allowed the children of Job to be killed or allow the, the death of Job's livestock. Not that Satan caused the death directly, but it would seem as if God was given permission to Satan to do those things to Job. And so I think I think there's a, a, a correlation between Satan being allowed to do the things that uh, he was allowed to do and the death of his children and his livestock and him suffering from disease and all of those things. It was seen from the book of Job as if Satan is causing those things. See, I put that directly on God, you know, because there's a there's story like you said about Eshu. There's a story that I read about Eshu where uh, the queen came to Eshu. And about her husband. Oh, that's and the that's the story. That's the story I'm gonna read word for word. It's, it's, so, it's really so I'm a, so I'm gonna let it go then, since you're gonna read it. the yeah, one yeah, where yeah. with the cut the beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna <laughs> let it go. I'm gonna let you go ahead and, and, and handle it. But um, so with the with the the book of Job, right? I think it's disingenuous for not not saying you know either one of you. But for, for people who follow that religion, to read the book of Job and make, as we say, in, as, as like my aunts and my mom would say, make S-U, I mean, make the devil the heavy. Like, to me, that's on God. You mm -hmm. know, whatever happened to Job, because I don't see God in the devil. I see two devils having a conversation, <coughs> for the lack of a better word. You know what I'm saying? And so if God has all this power, right, and God is a merciful God and God is a loving God, God does not even entertain that conversation. If I entertained a conversation with somebody about causing harm to you, you're not even going to 
say anything about the other guy, the other random guy I'm talking to, you're going to be like, wait a minute, how were you participating in that conversation with somebody about doing harm to me? So I think disingenuously, and I really don't even think it's disingenuous. I just think people don't actually read the Bible. And so they think stuff is in the Bible that's not actually in there. P people do a lot of what we call inferring. Mm -hmm. uh, without reading and understanding. See, the, the Bible is a dangerous thing when it's taken literally, brother. Mm -hmm. It's like giving a gun to an eight-year-old mm -hmm. or giving mm -hmm. the key a sports car. Uh, Jesus say, I'm going to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom to his disciples. Uh, we talking about a book that folks really couldn't really start reading to almost 600 something. It was locked <laughs> up 600 years. And, you know, now I understand why you have a priest class to I be see. able to interpret, to, to study those lessons. Because if you look at it on the surface, God is a you know, he throw it off, man. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at it from that perspective, you know, uh, that you would allow Job was his his most his his favorite person. Right. His most trusted servant. And you let him take a hit like that. But on the esoteric level, maybe Job needed a change. Mm. Maybe Job had got complacent. Mm. Maybe Job refused to move forward and mm. he had become stagnant. You know, he had, he had be became what well, he was prohibiting others from moving forward, from growing, from going into abundance, from going into new territory, from getting new ideas. Because what did he say to Adam and Eve? It was about the tree of life. Hey, you know, yeah, you go and eat that fruit. It's going to expand your consciousness. Right. And you know that's the story. I might need. We need to probably go back and delve in because uh, he say, you know, who, well, who told you you was naked? Mm -hmm. You know, wh who? Where did you get the consciousness to know that something was different about your state of being? It was the devil. What mm -hmm. did we say? You know that that picture of him with the pitchfork. Yeah. Maybe it's that thing to prod and push you forward. You right. know. If, and if if no if everybody that's hearing us, if they don't get nothing else, you know what I want them to take is that the devil is an issue about change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If so, if you stay in the same, if you having the same conversation about your life, matter of fact, by the end of this year, then you ain't moving. If you still, yep. if you still thinking and doing what you did. This time last year, the devil didn't trick you. Mm -hmm. You know, SU didn't trick you. And uh, you setting yourself up to be hurt by God <laughs> if you <laughs> want to take it to that level. So, you know, yeah, yeah. I, if you think those two characters, man, however, on what ex extremes are the, the levels they are, they're about trying to bring about a change, trying to bring about a condition to make you move forward. So would you agree that the expansion of consciousness at time, at times requires destruction, that it requires death, it requires uh, chaos, it requires confusion at times. Uh, and all of those things are the things that bring about change. Because in that instance, Eshu and the devil are exactly the same. Absolutely. They are exactly the same in, in that they both bring about confusion at times. They bring about chaos. They bring about destruction. They bring about debt, but all for the purpose of uh, bringing about fortitude, bringing about uh, strength and character, good character, those types of things. And in that sense, um, Satan and Eshu are exactly the same. They are exactly the same. So these are these are some of the conversations that Five Four and myself have had when we came to the conclusion, like, wait, maybe Eshu and Satan are the same. Maybe they do serve the same purpose, just in different uh, cosmologies. Because uh, in the Bible, the devil is definitely a, a minor character. 
definitely a minor character because it's not mm -hmm. in there. He's not in there a lot. He's and, definitely and, not in there a lot. Right, right. The mystique of the devil is outside of the Bible is way bigger than the depiction. And, you know, we talk about Eshu being the author of confusion. That is a title that I've heard given to the devil as well. And when you see Eshu being incarnated on earth in the old dual Warren Sobek, and you actually look throughout you know, the old dudes with a leg of a warrant. It talks about it, A, being a very spiritual old dude. And then two, a warrant is always associated with change. Right. And it's not, exactly. And it's not minor changes. A warrant is associated with foundational shifts and changes. So when a warrant comes down, spirit ain't telling you to change your hair color. You know what I'm saying? Spirit ain't telling you you might want to go to uh, the barbershop on a more frequent basis. No, it's talking about foundational shifts and changes. A warn also talks about all your choices, you know, which as was associated with giving us choice and introducing choice. All of our choices, the micro and the macro, is what's going to create the foundation. And that's why they say a warn is an unstable old dude. Because yeah. it's always shifting, it's always changing. And it tells you when you see a warrant come down, it tells you that you have to be uh, flexible, you have to be adaptable, and you also have to be optimistic and willing to change or you're going to invite that negativity. And if we look at things from a more esoteric standpoint, then we will see the beauty that the devil and Eshu brings to our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I say... <clears throat> spirituality is the most beautiful thing, brothers, when you can understand it. Mm. Mm. I should. In the stories, the myths, uh, the symbolism, God speaks through signs and symbols, and it is the oldest language there is. And I don't care when you get out of that, you know, no, nobody confu can confuse you when you know signs and symbols. Mm -hmm. It's you is SU the devil wants you to be able to recognize the signs and symbols when it comes time to change. Mm -hmm. SU and the devil show up when you haven't recognized the signs. Mm -hmm. You're still sitting there. They done told you, hey, a storm is coming. You ain't bought no water. You ain't got no, you don't have a generator. You don't have no plans. So yeah. We know it comes through all y'all, but that shoe has been. So with that old duo Warren and the other part about that old dude, it's like a Warren is like, here I come ready or not. <laughs> Ain't I'm not trying to wait and see if you, you know, well, let, let, let me get some stuff together. No. <laughs> and see, that's what that shoe and, and the devil do. And you know, when he, show, it's like when he show up, all you can say is damn. Mm -hmm. Ready. Right. You know, the beautiful thing about that is it brings about change. And it is the issue is the archway to mm. be able to go and transition to something new, man. To be able to, he is the key. He is the key man. He's the trained man mm -hmm. to, take, to, to take you to that other dimension, to that other plane, to that other state. Or if you just need to get across town, he the man. Absolutely. And if hey, Satan is the man too. He what he told out Eve, look at girl, go and eat that fruit. You gonna you, you gonna you gonna know some stuff, you gonna know some stuff that God knows. And what yeah. is that to me? To me, when I look at that story, the devil was on a, at a metaphysical perspective saying, eat the fruit so that it can expand. The God trigger and initiate the God in you. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with the conscious and the subconscious mind. So now that you can tap into the subconscious mind, that's all Satan trying to do. That's all. Absolutely. It's for you to go the subconscious. You know, you know, we uh, we interviewed one of our God sisters and we talked to her about Satanism and Luciferianism. And she was talking about how 
these entities basically deal with the individual. They deal with the self. It has to do with uh, change and transformation, and it has to do with uh, with elevation. And it would seem that that's the part in the cosmology that uh, that Satan plays in the Bible that he should play. That's the that's the role that we should give him. That's how he seems to be uh, portrayed in the Bible. And right. it's the same thing for Eshu in the Odui Fa. Usually, though, because we're so uh, emotional, we're usually attached to the the negative things that happen and not paying attention to, like you said, it goes back to, well, maybe Job had became stagnant. Maybe maybe Job wasn't moving forward anymore. Maybe Job had uh, had erred from his path. And so Satan, the devil, had to be introduced to get him back in line. So is this what I have to do? I have to kill your children. I have to bring you disease. I have to bring you destruction for you to finally get to a place where you can be still and say, aha, this is this is what um supposed to be doing. This is the path that uh, that I'm supposed to be walking. So when I think about the devil or when I think about Satan, I always think about a vehicle of change, a vehicle of the expansion of consciousness, um, a vehicle that, like you say, that allows the the creator in me to to ignite, to ignite. So I that's what I see when I uh, when I see both the devil and Eshu. Having this conversation with y'all is solidifying my belief in that uh, Eshu and Satan are the same if we see Satan in his correct portrayal in the Bible. And and that's that that's the piece because I've talked to um priests in Yoruba land and I'll ask them, hey, um is ask you the devil? And they they would say no. All then my next question would be, have you ever read the Bible? Uh-uh. So where do you get your portrayal of the devil? Because I actually read the Bible and I have, you know, the Apocrypha and all the other books. I had a different outlook on the devil when I came to Ifa. And so when I look at, read these pot of keys, I actually envision the devil. You know, when I read the story um, in uh, Agbe Warren, when Iku was coming to earth and they were he, killing people prematurely. And, Oth, um, and um, Arumala went to, you know, to the Awos to find out what do I need to do to, to stop this, right? It's causing chaos because people are going crazy because they like, I don't know when I'm going to die. So it's, it's chaos on the world. And one of the things that he had to do was had to make offering to Eshu. And so when Iku on the day of welling comes down to kill more people, he meets Eshu. And Eshu tricks him into sitting down and eating with him and after he gets done eating, he's like, where you about to go? Like, oh, I'm about to go kill a room. Like, he's like, nah, you just ate his food. And he like, oh, well, I didn't know that. He said, well, it's, it's your responsibility to inquire about all that. But, hey, you can't, you know, kill a room or his children. And that's where that agreement happened to where uh, Iku couldn't prematurely kill a room children. And so most of us, look at Eshu as the hero in that story because we're coming from a certain perspective. But there's also a perspective that says on the side of Iku, he played the typical devil character because you tricked mm -hmm. this person. You right. know what I'm saying? It's, and, and ironically, one of the things that Eshu is here to force us to do is to have a wider perspective, right? So that we can actually look at things and uh, their proper manner. And so, yeah, the more and more I actually think about Eshu and the devil, the more and more I'm like, it's the same energy. Mm. And, and you know, <clears throat> that whole, the whole thing about trying to make a move when, when, when you understand the signs, when you know, let's just put it like this, when you know something is just off in your life, or things are not going, it, it, you just feeling icky about some things. That's the devil. That's that shoe. 
trying mm -hmm. to get attention. And so when you get to that crossroad to help you to be able to either move left, he's already given you enough information. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the crossroad, you know whether to make the left or make the right. Now the mm -hmm. issue is when you get to the crossroad and you don't have the information on whether to make the left or right, then yeah, we got chaos. Right. You may take off on a red light and what you got, you got an accident. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, so it, it's about bringing clarity. You know, it's about bringing assurance to, to move forward. Because see, to me, the biggest thing, man, is what are you here to do? Um, how do you go by doing it? And to me, that's that's you. And I'll say again, when Jesus talked to, to the devil, Satan on the mountaintop, and he introduced him to some things over here, I'll give you this, man, I'll give you that. He was telling Jesus, look, you can go here and take care of your, of your conscious feeling, your conscious mind, or you can go here and deal with those things in the subconscious. The expansion, the one, the side that brings about building, the side that brings about new things. And if you look in scripture, it is it will tell you, or in the historical part, when Jesus left that mountaintop is when his ministry began. Mm -hmm. So after mm -hmm. the with the devil, he started his ministry. So right. a lot of us, when we go and start new things, when you brothers first came in the E5, you had a conversation with the devil. Mm. And then you move forward in this new direction, in this new life, on this new road. Mm -hmm. okay? I say. I say. Yeah. I so, say. so it seems like at both SU and Satan are saying, come to me before I come to you. <laughs> come to yeah. me. Yeah. Come to me before I have to come to you. You need to, mm -hmm. you need to uh, take responsibility and accountability for yourself. Uh, Come to me before I come to you. Yeah, you're right. The um the the story of Jesus on the on the mountain having a conversation with Satan. You know, Farfora and myself, we always talk about, or he always says that you have to choose your destiny twice. You choose it both in a room and you have to consciously choose it again here. And it seems like that's mm -hmm. what Jesus was doing with Satan on the mountain. He was choosing his destiny again. He was like, This is this is what I came here to do. Satan was tempting him with something else. Like you can, you know, you don't really have to, you can not choose your destiny this time and you can, you can go down this path. And Jesus at that time said, I'll continue along the path of my destiny. And like you say, his, um, his, his ministry begins. So that's definitely how I see the, uh, the, the connectivity between Eshu and Satan. They are both agents of change, agents of transformation agents of uh getting rid of stagnation making you move making you move one way or the other whether it be for your benefit or to your detriment and i think that's what most people hold on to they hold on to uh, they look at the detrimental things yeah. that take place when you don't follow uh say the advice of the bible hour when you don't make your offerings to to issue and the uh the destruction that ensues afterwards what we pay attention to is what happens at the end we don't we never pay attention to us not following our destiny us not doing the things that we were supposed to be doing uh, so yeah i definitely see uh Eshu and satan as the same this is going to definitely be controversial uh because they are going to be because the title is going to be big Eshu is the devil or Eshu mm -hmm. is uh is satan so people are going to mm -hmm. see that and be thrown off by it. so this is going to be controversial we're going to make some people mad. Hopefully uh, people are able to uh, read between the lines and get to what we're trying to get to. So I got I got another question, though, because there's a there's a concept in Ifa that we usually don't talk about. That's also linked to Satan or the devil, whether we're talking about uh, exoteric or esoteric. And that's the dichotomy between Orun Rere and Orun Baruku. So it would seem that. We say that there is no hell in Ifa, but there seems to be a less desirable place to go once the body dies. Um, and we don't talk about that. We don't we don't talk about that. And this is not a Lukumi thing. This is a this is both a Lukumi and a traditional thing. We just don't usually talk about it here in 
in America. So this is this is another thing that helps me to solidify my thought in Eshu and Satan or the devil being the same. Being the same. So do y'all have any thoughts about this? What 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 if I calls Orun Baruku or bad Orun or Orun Apadi, which is the uh the Orun of broken postures of broken dishes where things are discarded. Uh so it it would seem as if there are some souls that go to to that place to suffer. Uh do you know anything about about that uh uh philosophy of Ifa? I, I've heard a little bit about it, but I, you know, to be honest, I'm I'm not too uh, educated as you brothers are. But the the whole thing is, whatever fake system, and it's just something you know. Again, we're talking about esoteric, esoteric. To me, it's a state that you find yourself in when you haven't done what you're supposed to do. Hmm. You know, hell is a state. And, and you know, mm -hmm. again, the entities, the spirits, when they leave here, that you know, I don't want to say yay or nay to that because that there is when we're talking about the spirit world, there may be a place where spirit lingers that gotta go get their stuff together. They didn't get their stuff right. together. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, there's a debt that was see, we, we we can also look at that that whole concept of SU having to get those people the, with the fairy man. Mm -hmm. Those those people trapped in a place, or spirits trapped in a place that need that you to come deliver, uh, that need uh, the ferryman or the train man to take them from that state. So I look mm -hmm. at everything state. I'm, I'm more and more, and as I go off this journey, and the older I get, there's the states of mind, mm -hmm. and some of us are in a E5 hell or just a, a regular hell when it comes to uh, the state of everyday life and how we, we ebb and flow in this world, man. You know? I say, I say. You know, based on what you were saying, Oshayun, you know, that's like we have certain um, funerary rites. There's a ritual that we go through to assist the spirit on making the journey from earth to the, to the spiritual realm. And so to me, it's like those things play a role into that transition. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I see where it says that, you know, there's a part of the funeral where the, you're just crying profusely because your tears help assist the spirit on his journey to the ancestral realm. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I've been to Nigeria not to Yoruba land, but to Igbo land, to the village. And despite how Christian they are, they still do some ancestral things when it comes to funerals. So there's still some kind of a cultural continuity when it comes to um, burials and things of that nature. You know, I, I know somebody who had their hand in Ifa and they passed. And, you know, the stuff came out, the flyer for their funeral, and it was at a church. And I remember thinking to myself, like, man, we really got to get our stuff together so that we can make sure that the people of our faith, when they pass, they can have a traditional uh, funeral ceremony. So, you know, it's, it's it, but it, to answer your question, it's concept like that and concept of being able to select a bad head in heaven, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around those, you know, kind of concepts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is going to be controversial, man. This is going to be one of those, uh, <laughs> one of those, this is going to be, this is going to be the equivalent to our abortion episode. <laughs> wow. And, and, yeah. you know, yeah. and maybe Satan will visit those who are stuck. <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. Let the devil get them, man. Go get them, devil. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oshayun, you had a story for us. That yeah, you I want to read this. It's real short, and this is the story that uh, that you brought up, Fafore. Uh, and again, this is this is this goes further into our belief that Eshu and Satan are, if not the same. 
uh, very similar. In this book, this 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 pataki is entitled "Eshu Has a Taste for Sparking Intrigue." It says, one day long ago, Eshu paid a visit to a queen who was in great despair for having been abandoned for a very long time by her husband, the Oba. Eshu said, do not fall into despair. There is something that can be done to fix this matter. The queen said, is there? Eshu said, certainly there is. He took out a knife from his bag and gave it to the queen and said, take this knife and go cut a few hairs from the Oba's beard tonight. Then bring them to me and I will use them to make a magical amulet for you. I guarantee that the am I, I guarantee that the amulet I will make will bring the Oba back to you. Afterwards, Eshu went to visit the son of the queen, the prince inheritor of the Oba's throne. He lived in a farmland situated on the outskirts of the limits of Oba's palace. The kingdom's chiefs determined his living arrangement as a precaution to prevent him from attempting the assassination of the Oba. Everyone knew that the young prince was eager to take over his father's throne. As she said to the prince, tomorrow the Oba will go off the war for a very long time, and he wants to see you and your warriors at his place tonight. The Oba said that it is very important that you come. Afterwards, as she went to visit the Oba and said, the queen is very hurt. She is angry about your coldness toward her. The Oba said, that is not good. As you said, the queen is seeking revenge and she wants to kill you. Be very careful. She will come for you tonight. Make sure you do not fall asleep or she will succeed in killing you. When the night came, the Oba went to his bed to rest, but he did not fall asleep. Shortly afterwards, he saw the queen enter his quarters. She approached him and held a knife to his neck. The queen was trying to cut a few hairs from the Oba's beard. However, without knowing her real intention, the Oba believed that she was trying to kill him, as Eshu had said. The Oba tried to disarm the queen and they fought each other, causing a big commotion. At that moment, the young prince arrived at the palace with his warriors. When he heard the screams coming from the Oba's quarters, he and his warriors rushed to the Oba's aid. When they entered the quarters, the, they saw the Oba holding a knife. The prince thought the Oba was about to kill his mother. When the Oba saw his son entering his quarters in the middle of the night, armed, armed and followed by his warriors, he was sure that his son had come to kill him. Immediately, he called his guards to come and help. The Oba's guards came right away. There was a fierce fight followed by a general massacre, and everyone was dead. Eshu appeared. He said, this matter is resolved, and Eshu was happy. So it seems as if uh, in this portrayal of Eshu, that he caused the deaths of many people. He caused the massacre of many people. Now, of course, this story is separated from the Odu, and this story is separated from the verse that probably told the queen, the Oba, and the son to make certain offerings to Eshu, and that he needed to be venerated, and that they didn't do what needed to be done. So again, they were off their path, and so Eshu had to come to them before they went to, uh, because they didn't go to Eshu. But again, it's stories like this that lead me again to, to believe and kind of come to the knowledge that both Eshu and the devil are the same and that they serve the same purpose in these different cosmologies. And that's as agents of, of change, of expansion. That's both spiritually and consciously. Mm. You know, you said something important and I don't want people to like miss that in the whole story that you told is that I, I do love, you know, I know where you got that story from. We had a book with a lot of stories about all the Orishas. But when it's separated from the old dude, right? And it's, and it's separated from the entire story. Because mm -hmm. in, in every pot to key, there's somebody went and, spoke, and talked to a diviner. The diviner, you know, gave them their reading gave them their elbow, they either made it or didn't, and as a result, these things played out. And mm -hmm. so in, in these stories, we don't get that. You know, there's a story that's about just as bad um, as that one about the maiming of Osayin when Babla went to Eshu because Osayin was getting all the business. And he went to Osayin and said, hey, can you share some of the business? And Osayin just ignored him. So he went to Eshu, made an offering to Eshu, and Eshu caused Osayin's house to collapse 
and that's how OCIN is named. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading that story like that's crazy. But again, we don't have the full story to really to glean what was the message, right? It's like they they took out the message and they just gave us like the gory details. Right, but right. as you sure. said, that is a way to kind of um, you know see the devil and Eshu in a, a very similar light. But again, it's not a negative thing. Even the Odu, as Yogbe says, positive and negative comes in equal amounts, right? You, you got to have that friction. And without friction, there's no growth and evolution. Uh, Bob, we'll give you the last word. You got any last word? You know, tell the people uh, where they can find you, what you got going on, all that good stuff. Hey, uh, hey, man, another good show, brothers, man. I just tip my hat to y'all because uh, y'all having some conversation. <laughs> y'all, y'all make some folks think they either pissed off or they <laughs> <laughs> after they turn y'all off. But uh, hey, I'm here in Houston, Texas. Uh, start, started a community. You can find me uh, www.churchofhealthandwealth.com. I'm all about um, getting my people to understand that. African spirituality ain't it ain't of the devil, it ain't demonic. I'm still teaching and preaching to my folks in the church because that's been my assignment. That's what as you spoke to me in my ear to go back to America and help your people. So I just want people to understand, ask the question, what am I here to do? You know, and how do I go about doing it? And as you will bring you some clarity. I should. I should. Baba, we appreciate you as always. As always. You know, um, and just for the people, you know, I called Baba. I told Baba, you know, hey, Baba, we, we, we need you. You know what I'm saying? We going to need some covering from an elder, <laughs> you know, on this one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To, to keep the people off our backs. And I told him the, the topic, and he just laughed and said, man, y'all going deep. Let's do it. And so, uh, <laughs> You know, we appreciate you always showing up and showing out for us whenever we call. Hey, man, I appreciate you, brothers. Ashe, Ashe, family, thank y'all for, for checking us out again, man. Listen, we're not here to change y'all. We're just here to make you think a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So, um, again, we appreciate y'all for, for rocking with us again for another episode. And whether you are spiritual or religious or you just don't know what to believe, you will always have a safe space here with us because if somebody made us priests, there's hope for you too. <laughs> Peace. Peace. Peace.